Hello and welcome to this lecture on molecular interactions. At the end of this video you'll be able to define the types of intermolecular interactions, identify the contributions to the Leonard-Jones potential, and identify the shortcomings of the Leonard-Jones potential. So as we know the internal energy is an important property of a fluid and that the internal energy is made up of a combination of the kinetic energy and also the potential energy. The molecular kinetic energy is a product of the translation of molecules, the uh, rotation and stretching of molecules and also the, uh, the, the rotation and uh, bond bending of molecules as well. Now anything that has a temperature has this kinetic energy. So that's everything from uh, solids all the way through to ideal gases. All of them have kinetic energy. Now the potential energy within a, uh, a, a molecular system or a fluid is made up of the chemical bonds. Okay, so these are the things that that give us the endothermic and exothermic reactions. And then the other thing are the intermolecular interactions. Okay, so, so what are the interactions between molecules? Now to this point, we've been essentially ignoring these interactions. So, so for an ideal gas, these interactions aren't important. Okay, or uh, they're actually assumed to be zero. But for everything except for an ideal gas, these interactions between the molecules are very, very important. So because these interactions between the molecules are the reasons that we get condensed phases. Uh, and then in addition to that, when we do get condensed phases or we have very high pressure phases, the when molecules are close together, then their size and their shape start to impact what's going on okay so so this the rest of this lecture and uh, the next couple of weeks are going to be concerned with how these intermolecular forces impact the properties of fluid systems now of course we know that intermolecular uh, properties or intermolecular interactions affect the properties of fluids okay so if they didn't we wouldn't get condensed phases and so what we have in this plot are a series of isotherms for methane. And so starting from the left-hand side, we have uh, the isotherms at uh, well above the critical temperature. Okay, so, so these ones over here are at 300 Kelvin. And then as we decrease the temperature, okay, so 190 Kelvin in green and then 150 Kelvin in red, then we see that the the ideal gas behavior okay so this is the behavior de denoted by the the dotted lines as this behavior starts to really poorly represent what's going on okay so the real behavior shown by the by the solid lines um, is initially quite good well above the critical temperature okay so the solid line here at 300 Kelvin but then at 190 Kelvin okay which is the critical point and then at 150 Kelvin which is well below the critical point we start seeing really big deviations from ideal gas behavior okay and so and of course at 150 Kelvin we're getting condensation from the vapor phase to the liquid phase Okay, and then uh, as we increase the density over this side, we're really seeing uh, very strong repulsion happening. Of course, none of these things can happen for an ideal gas. And so phases and phase diagrams uh, are something that we'll be occupied with a lot later in the course. Okay, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on them now. So now that we've identified intermolecular interactions as being 
an important component of what's going on for fluid systems, it's now good to look at what are the things that make up these molecular interactions. And so we'll be looking at, uh, at three types of interactions in the next couple of slides. Dispersion forces, electrostatic forces, and then induced forces. So what we're going to start with are the electrostatic forces between point charges because these are the easiest to understand and, and quite immediate to see okay, and so so if we have point charges then uh, it's easy to see that they interact with each other either if both of the uh, interactions are positive then they will uh, repel each other okay if one of these interactions was negative instead of uh, instead of positive then what we would get is so if this is negative and this one was positive then they would actually be drawn to each other rather than drawn away from each other and so so the force between them uh, is dictated by Coulomb's law so this should be familiar to you from physics and then the thing that we're interested in is the potential energy Okay, so, so the potential energy between these two things, okay, is the integral of the force. And so the potential energy is given by this equation here. And so the important thing is, is that the interaction energy decays to the power or to the inverse of the separation between the charges. And this is, is very important. Uh, because as we'll see in a minute, the other types of interactions actually behave quite differently to this. Now, instead of having a, uh, a simple point charge, it's possible for molecules to have distributed charges on them. And when these distributed charges don't even up, okay, so, so if we've got more negative charges at one end, and then more positive charges at the other end, then what we end up with is a net dipole. Okay, and so, so that is this arrow on the left-hand side. So we've got a dipole acting in this direction, which says that in the direction of the arrow, uh, the molecule is more positive than at the other end. Okay, so because chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen is. And so the fact that we've got this charge separation means that we've got something similar going on to what we had with the point charges. Okay, and so, so what's happening is that the um, the partial charges that we have on a on a dipole or on a polar molecule they interact with each other. Okay, and so they interact with each other in a similar way to uh, to point charges. Okay, so so if we have a look at what's going on here now, if things are end to end, then these two are going to attract each other. And then if we flip things around a little bit, then these two ends are going to repel each other. And so what we can do is we can say, okay, if the molecules are far enough away from each other, we can simply uh, rotate the molecule and then average out the interaction. And so when we average out the interaction, what we get is that the interaction is a, a function of the the dipoles that exist on the uh, on the molecules, and then importantly, it's a function of the it's a function of the the separation between the molecules to the power of six. Okay, so we remember that for the just the point charges, the interaction was proportional to one on R. So here it's proportional to the power of one on R to the six. So these interactions decay much more quickly compared with the Coulomb interactions. Then in addition to that, if we have a, uh, a charge or a dipole sitting next to a molecule that doesn't normally have a dipole. Okay, so here we've got uh, hydrogen chloride. It's got its charge separation, so uh, negative at the chlorine end, positive at the hydrogen end. And then if we have something that normally has no charge distribution, so argon, in this case, what will happen is you'll actually get an induced dipole 
happening. So, so we get a little positive charge here and a little negative charge here by virtue of the fact that it's sitting next to this uh, charged molecule. Okay, and so so what we see is is that the uh, the interaction here is proportional to something called polarizability. Okay, so so the more polarizable a molecule is, the more uh, susceptible it is to having this charge created on it. And so again, when we look at the interaction between two molecules, and if they're far enough apart, we can average the interaction. And what we find is, is that the interaction, again, is this 1 on R to the power of 6. Okay, so this is uh, similar to what we saw with the dipoles, but different to what we saw with the Coulomb interactions. Now, dispersion forces are due to little fluctuations in molecules. Okay, so, so for brief moments in time, the molecules do have charge distributions. And when you add all these things up over time, then you get a net uh, attractive force between molecules. Again, it's proportional to the polarizability. Okay, the tendency to have these fluctuations is proportional to the polarizability. And when we uh, sum this all up, then uh, van der Waals, uh, who we'll talk about in the next lecture, um, was able to collect all these terms together. And he was able to say, well, for the interaction between molecules under dispersion forces, I can say that the interaction is uh, equal to some proportionality constant, okay, related to the polarizability, divided by R on 6. Okay, so again, we're seeing that. 1 on R to the 6 relationship. And so if we if we summarize this, then what we see is we have a, uh, a class of, of uh, interactions that decay in 1 to the 6. Okay, and then over on its own is the interaction of point charges. Okay, so, so what we see is that for molecules reasonably far apart, and as long as they don't have a point charge on them, then we've got this set of reasonably consistent equations which are all proportional to 1 on R to the 6, okay, where R is the, the separation between molecules I and J. Now, now that we see this consistency, uh, we might suppose there might, there might be a way to put these things together into a model. Now, we're missing one element in making that happen. And that element is the repulsive force. Okay, so, so when you bring molecules close together, they really repel each other. And so what we have here is we have the, we have the interaction strength. Okay, so the interaction strength on this axis. And then the separation between molecules on this axis. And this line here is the repulsion. Okay, so as we bring molecules together, the interaction strength becomes greater than zero and becomes very, very positive. Okay, so, so a negative interaction strength in this region here is an attraction and a positive interaction strength is a repulsion. And this repulsion is very strong. And so it's been estimated uh, by some people as being proportional to 1 on R to the 12. Now, this is uh, not exact, okay, but it's a reasonable estimate of what's going on. Now, if we add those two things together, the repulsion and the attraction, what we get is something called the Leonard-Jones potential. And so the Leonard-Jones potential is split into the... Uh, is split into the repulsive part, okay, which is taken care of by this equation, and then the attractive part, which takes into account all these interactions here, okay, so, and they're all put in, so, so what we get is an effective interaction potential that attempts to model all these different things. Now, what the Leonard-Jones potential is not good at is that it does not account for point charges. Okay, it's completely hopeless at this. And then in addition to that, 
it's held to the same assumptions as all these other equations here okay so the assumptions that we have for making these uh, interaction potentials okay for dipoles and induced dipoles are also assumptions that are built into the Leonard Jones potential so if molecules are very close to each other and we can't average the interaction then the Leonard Jones potential starts to fail okay so to recap everything except an ideal gas has intermolecular interactions so if we're going to uh, to model these things then we need to take it into account intermolecular interactions can be of several types okay coulomb dipole induced dipole dispersion okay and that changes depending on what molecules we're looking at intermolecular interactions are attractive unless molecules are very close to each other and they're close enough to start to repel each other and finally, the Leonard Jones potential is an empirical approximation of interactions. It's a model. And in the next lesson, we'll see how this model can be used. Okay, thanks for your time.